Graduates Conversations podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever All Graduates Conversations podcast. Uh, very lucky to have here today with us Dr. Erica Gonzalez Garcia. Um, and uh, we are going to chat about the importance of formal training for translators and interpreters. Now, Erica is the program manager of the Master in Translating and Interpreting program at RMIT University. Um, she pretty much coordinates all the courses. Um, she pretty much teaches all the courses these days, um, as well as uh, teaching conference interpreting in the newly built world-class conference interpreting lab which uh, I guess we'll touch on a little bit as well. Um, Erica, amongst many other things, is also the current Ozit president, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll get her in wearing her Ozit president hat one day and have a chat um, about yeah. other things on that day. And on top of all these things that I mentioned, you are also a mother of two primary school children, yeah. and, and I've met them, they are beautiful, and that's gotta be extra demanding these days, right? So I'm extra super grateful that uh, you are here today with us. Welcome, Erica, and thank you so much for agreeing to be my first ever guest on our Conversations podcast. How's it going? Good, good, thanks. Well, not too excited that we're here in Victoria. We're going into six additional weeks of lockdown, but it is what it is. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for being here. Well, at least we've got a little bit of uh, experience from the first lockdown. We kind of know how it's supposed to be done now, right? That's right. That's right. Um, very good. Now, we said that amongst all these things, you are also a practitioner yourself. So you're a conference interpreter. Um, you work all over the world. You're world renowned. Um, and you also work as a community translator interpreter as well. And you have received formal TNDI education. And you've been a teacher, a trainer, an educator for 17 years now on top of all this. So as a practitioner and an educator, how important is having a formal training for an interpreter or a translator? Well, uh, Fatih, I think that in any other profession, no one would challenge that a doctor or a lawyer doesn't have university level training. So with us, translating and interpreting, it's a fully fledged profession and it should be the same. Now, I am aware and, and we know that for some languages, it is really difficult to offer a tertiary education uh, or tertiary level training. And we've got other avenues for that. But basically up until not long ago, people would think that because someone speaks two languages, they are able to translate and interpret. And actually I've got a, a BA in translating and interpreting, a master in uh, specialized translation, and then I did my research. And despite uh, all these years, I still keep doing um, continuous PD and learning every day. So basically, if we want to consider our profession, translating and interpreting at the same level as many others, we have to give it the same chances. And as I said, um, about other professions, no one would challenge or question that a law lawyer or a doctor doesn't have any qualifications. And yet we work with these people. That's right. We work in the same environments. Yeah, okay, we might not be performing the operation, but as a simultaneous interpreter, I've been interpreting an operation, a cochlear implant operation. And still, you need to know about, you know, not obviously as tirelessly as the doctor, but you need to know your terminology. You need to know what you're talking about. So you need to have the resources, the knowledge to manage that. And it's really difficult to achieve that kind of knowledge on your own or just um, via self-directed learning. So I am obviously as an academic, but also as a practitioner, I am a big advocate for a structured and official learning, if you like. But also, uh, and I am one of your former students as well. And um, thank you very much for that too. Now, we always used to talk about uh, professionalism and our own profession being seen as a profession. 
you know, we are there working with the lawyers and the doctors yep. um, and many other professionals on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, if we don't receive that formal training, do you think we will be seen as a professional amongst these other professions? Well, the problem I think is that there's there's such huge differences among ourselves. I think I don't know if in other, any other profession there are so many differences among the practitioners. You've got people with masters and PhDs, and then people who barely have any training because we need them in the community. So uh, when someone you know comes to a new country and there are no training resources for a given language. Some people out of necessity become translators and interpreters for, for their communities. But at the same time, obviously, if you've got someone at this level and someone at this one, and we have seen many interpreters who do not perform professionally, for example, for one of my courses, students have to go to courts and tribunals, observe interpreters working, and then they have to write a report. And sometimes I'm at home marking those reports and just wanting to pull my hair because of the students, the things they describe about the professional behavior or unprofessional behavior of some colleagues. So obviously if we behave unprofessionally, if we are not at this level, the other professions are not gonna see us as professionals. That's very true. How, how do we bring that uh, to a level? I mean, we already have so many practitioners out there um, that haven't had formal training. Yep. And uh, I guess they didn't have to prior to 2018, right? And uh, since 2018, you have to have some kind of formal training now. Um, so how do, how do we level that out in the long run? Are, are practitioners who are already practicing, are they able to do courses to maybe bring that level up? Of course. Uh, look, uh, for some practitioners, professional development is the only way to improve. In many, many professional development courses I've delivered, I've had practitioners saying, I've been practicing for 30 years. I don't need to do that. Yes, but you might have been practicing for 30 years doing the wrong thing because no one taught you to do the right thing because you're doing what you think is best for you. And I'll give you a really good example. I started practicing in Europe. I was trained as a conference interpreter because at the time in Spain, where I come from, uh, community interpreting was not such a thing. So then when we started having influx from people coming from Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, et cetera, especially those regions, authorities realized that, oh, these people need interpreters in courts, in hospitals. When um, I left Spain in 2008, there were not even um, community interpreters in hospitals. They were only provided in the legal setting. So here I am, a duly trained interpreter, and I thought, yeah, I can go to court. This is easy. I've done conferences. How wrong was I? Despite being trained, I was not trained as a community interpreter. I would it's embarrassing to say I would flout the code of ethics left, right, and center. And I was a trained interpreter, but I was not trained as a community interpreter, and there wasn't a thing such as the code of ethics until I enrolled in a, a research degree and I started looking into countries like Canada, Australia, who've worked extensively in community settings. And that's where I realized, oh, all this I'm doing, it's wrong. So, of course, I had to study, I had to put time and research before I realized that I was doing the, the wrong thing. So that's the point I want to make, that it's important to get some sort of foundation, even if you've been uh, interpreting for 30 years. In professional development courses, you will hear from other colleagues, colleagues from your same language pair, from other language pairs, and that interaction also allow us, allows us to learn from each other. So to me, these days there are avenues. There's a professional association, OSIT, uh, which offers continuous PD. Uh, all those working for all grads are lucky that uh, the company takes continuous development and training so seriously. So avenues like these ones, you have to make the most of it. Um, some of you might want to take it one step further and enroll in a tertiary education course or in a short course delivered by any of the universities at national level. So I think that like in many other professions, we have to strive for, for providing the best possible service to our clients. And that's really difficult to achieve, as I said uh, beforehand, by a self-directed learning. To some extent, yes, but we need other colleagues. We need instructors to 
tell us, you know, okay, this is what you've been doing wrong. We should do it like this, etc. And also, it's always evolving, isn't it? I mean, even if you were, uh, you, you have been practicing for 25, 30 years, I mean, the world is constantly evolving. I mean, look at the current situation that we're in. Um, we are going to be uh, changing things probably indefinitely um, yeah. within the TNI industry. There are already some changes that have come in. Um, so let's say for a practicing um, or, or a non-practicing interpreter translator, what are the current training programs at RMIT University, for example, that are available? Yep. So at RMIT, we've got a whole suite of courses to basically cover every level we've got. So in the tape of vocational education sector, we've got the skill set, which is, uh, Fatih, you've taught in this course, I think it's 10 or 12 weeks. I have, yeah, 10 weeks. Yeah, 10, 10, weeks. 10 weeks. It's a 10 week course, non-language specific. And this course provides you with the minimum requirements to see the NATI uh, provisionally certified or recognized interpreter. Uh, or to gain a recognized interpreter credentials. So, uh, even to get a recognition now, you have to uh, do this course as a minimum, right? It's one of the requirements. There are other avenues to get the recognition as well, like, for example, um, having maybe qualifications from um, your home country or your load country. There are other avenues, but this one is one of the avenues to also get the recognized interpreter credential. Then you've got the diploma in interpreting, which is um, for provisionally certified interpreters. And then it's the advanced diploma, which is at professionally uh, certified level. And then we've got the higher education or university level, which is for those who hold uh, previous tertiary qualifications, like a master, a BA, um, a bachelor's degree, a graduate diploma, and also for those who have five years of more of professional experience. Okay. So if you don't yeah. have tertiary qualifications, but let's say you've been an interpreter for 10 years, then you would be eligible to also do the master's or the graduate diploma. And now uh, we are lucky that with the COVID uh, crisis, the government has funded several courses which they believe are needed in the community. And one of them is the graduate certificate in translating and interpreting, which runs for 12 weeks. And then at the end of it, you can sit for the professional uh, translator test or the provisionally certified interpreter test. And if your languages are not available uh, for testing, then obviously you would be able to uh, get um, credentials recognized. So Recognition, that's right. So let's talk about these scholarships. Now, um, governments from time to time, they offer scholarships for our industry. And I think they're offered at uh, VE level, so vocational education level, and at the higher education level. So um, I know you have strong views on the importance of scholarships as well. Uh, So why are scholarships so important for our industry? Why do we need scholarships? And this current scholarship for the grad cert, uh, the graduate certificate in translation interpreting, um, who provides that? Okay, so for vocational education in Victoria, I have to say we're very, very lucky with the local government. In Victoria, the government assesses the need of languages and then funds courses uh, for the TAFE a stream or branch of RMIT so that they offer um, positions or or spots in the course for those who um, are working in those languages that are most needed in the community, okay? And that's from the local Victorian government. To me, quality, it's a shared responsibility. The onus doesn't only lay in interpreters, and that's why I think that service providers, governments also, fulfill a very important role at the time of sourcing well-educated interpreters. Then there's another issue that goes beyond translating and interpreting. To me, education is a right and not a privilege. That's right. So the fact I come from a university system where I had to pay minimum fees. So when you see that in countries like Australia, university studies or education in general, tertiary education is so commodified it really breaks my heart. So obviously I'm a big advocate of scholarships and grant schemes that um, allow students to study for free or at a reduced 
price. Because as I said, um, we provide the service to the society and thus, um, and as I've repeated before, quality is a shared responsibility. We take the responsibility to educate ourselves, but then the government, the institutions take the responsibility to fund that education so that they get the best. That's right. Now, another issue is that uh, these uh, our policymakers have probably gotten through their university degrees without paying anything, but yep. um, that's 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 another uh, matter to talk about on another day. Um, so let's talk specifically about the graduate certificate in translating and interpreting program. Um, at RMIT University. Uh, so you were saying this goes for 12 weeks yes. and uh, there is a government subsidy for this. Is that yes. right? Yep. So basically the government has um, selected, so to speak, certain positions, certain uh, professions, and basically um, they are offering this degree as an avenue for many people who have lost their jobs in other industries. For example, one of my recent applicants, she was working in the um, aviation industry. She got stood down because of coronavirus, because obviously planes are not flying, all the flights have been cancelled. So she applied for this scheme to upskill and change professions. So this was the main aim of this um, subsidy. Now, many of our uh, colleagues who are applying are also translators and interpreters who got their NATI accreditation long time ago, and they want to obviously acquire some solid theoretical foundations, and they are also applying for, for this course so that they can upskill. So basically the course, I think it's about 12, on top of my head, about $12,000 and the government is subsidizing it heavily so that applicants have only to pay $1,250 yeah. if I'm not wrong. So if I've done my homework right, the course itself in entirety costs $12,960. And yes. after the government uh, pays for a, a big part of it, the yes. student is only out of pocket $1,250. Now, which I believe is also, uh, you, you, can, you can deter it through, defer it through HEX as well. Yes, so, uh, yes that's correct. You can put those $1,000 through HEX as well. So which potentially you might, be, you might not be out of pocket a single dollar for this course. Exactly. With HEX, uh, we need to clarify that this is the loan scheme that yep. you start paying for your university fees once you start working and making above a given threshold. That's right. That's right. But initially, you might potentially not be out of pocket. That's anything. correct. All right. That's correct. And that's, I think, important to highlight. As well. I, th I think so. So the course itself is $12,960 after the heavy government subsidy comes down to $1,250, um, which potentially you can then uh, defer by uh, loaning it through HEX. Yes, that's um, right. The course goes for 12 weeks. What kind of, uh, sorry, the program goes for 12 weeks. What kind of courses are in there? What do, what will the potential students learn? So basically, it's a basic course, obviously, to get the students to sit for the basic uh, NATI certification test. So basically, they, they study this course of theoretical basis of translating and interpreting, depending on the semester they join in. At the moment, it's this course. Then they've got interpreting accrediting practice one or and or translating accrediting practice one, advanced English, and, and ethics and professional issues. Very good. So... If I don't have any credentials, I can do this course um, in 12 weeks and that'll get me to be eligible to sit the NATI test for the Certified Provisional Interpreter That's and correct. Certified Translator. That's that correct. Right? And obviously, if your language is or your language is not tested at this level, then you would be able to apply for like recognition. recognition. Yeah. Um, if I'm already an interpreter and I want to become a translator, I want my translator uh, NATI credential or vice versa, could I still do this program as well? Yes, of course you do. And many of our colleagues actually are using uh, what we call recognition of prior learning. So they get credits for, for example, um, someone has just recently sat the NATI test and did the ethics a test separately. So she's requiring recognition of prior learning 
for the ethics course because she did a similar course with okay. Nancy. So um, we also provide recognition of prior learning for the accreditations you already have. So for example, Fatih, let's imagine that you are a Turkish interpreter, Nati certified, but you want to do translation from Turkish into English, let's say, or yep. English into Turkish. So uh, because you've already done ethics, obviously to sit for your Nati test, you could apply for credits or recognition of prior learning for ethics and your um, interpreting for the interpreting course. And then you would have to do only, let's say if you're interpreting, sorry, if you're translating from Turkish into English and you might not be a native speaker of English, you could do translating accrediting practice one and advanced English, which for all of us who are not native speakers of English, mm -hmm. And even for native speakers of English, it's a course oh, yes. where you learn English grammar, referencing, and basically you do lots of academic writing as well. So that could be, for example, a really good course. So instead of having to do four courses, you would only do two of them. Uh, very good. So also, if I'm, let's say, for the certified translator test, will it uh, make me eligible to sit the test in both directions? That's another yes, question that yes. I'm getting. We always recommend that um, students translate into their strongest direction. In my case, I'm only certified into Spanish. I never attempted into English. It's not my, it's my third language and I never felt confident at translating into English, to be honest. So I would only do into Spanish. Now, um, imagine that now I have a change of heart and I want to get certified from Spanish into English. So I would enroll in this course to do just that. But um, we only allow one direction because obviously when we organize tutorials, it's a different tutorial for mm. those doing Spanish into English or English into Spanish. So you need to only um, decide you in choose, one direction. A direction. Exactly. And then there are many people who, for example, choose the other direction if they continue into the master's or the graduate diploma. But to start with, um, it's demanding. Uh, as you all know, the NATI mm. fail rate, it's quite high. So we it's, recommend... It's not an easy test. <laughs> it's not one of those easy tests. And as I said, the fail rate is really high. So we would recommend that people just concentrate or focus on one direction and really put all their eggs in one basket until they pass. And we do this to also ensure or make sure that um, we gain success at the end of the semester. That's a really good recommendation. Now, if you wanted to take this graduate certificate into a graduate diploma or a master's, am I able to do that? Yes, of course you are. So at the end of it, then you just have to uh, request a variation and you can say that you want to continue with your enrollment and then ad uh, admin services would deal with it. And But I can sit the test and then continue with my studies. I don't yes. have to... Yes, certainly. What you would do is uh, request an exit and I would give you a piece of paper which says that you've completed so many credits, which is equivalent to a grad cert. And then you would be able to sit for the provisionally certified interpreter or certified translator and then continue with your studies. And many okay. students actually do that because they want to obviously get their certification and start working in order to start also. You know, and then you can you can work and study at the same time, which is exactly. really good. Yeah. Look, um, at the moment, we are really, really supportive of people who, who work. Uh, most of our um, students are mature students with care responsibilities. So um, we are very flexible and many of these students take their courses part time, one, two courses at the time and to study on their own pace. And in, in regards to uh, the current situation that we're in, and I understand that this program was uh, offered face-to-face -face originally, um, and I think now everything's gone online, is that right? That's correct. We offer everything entirely online. I was, at the beginning, I was freaking out about um, teaching interpreting online, but it's feasible. How's that, how's that been? So you, you've got one semester experience in this now, and, and how, how was that? Actually, it was much better than we anticipated. It was uh, wonderful to see how everybody adapted so well. And that um, success is also uh, thanks to our tutors. And if any of them are seeing us, 
Fatih included, thank you so much because you made it work and they, they and have people, done they have done very well. <laughs> yes, they were real heroes and people got to enjoy doing the interpreting class in their pajamas. You don't need Indeed. to get ready, you don't need to commute. So it's got obviously some disadvantages. You don't have the human warmth, the physical interaction, but it's true that these days we've got very powerful remote platforms and it's absolutely um, possible to teach online and it's the the direction the world is uh um going so we just That's have right. to embrace it well there, there is a lot of um video interpreting and a lot of telephone interpreting done these days more than i guess uh before uh covid19 hit so right. it's actually going pro pretty much in line with the current industry demands i guess exactly so students will be absolutely prepared to work in those environments. Look, my next conference, which usually it's held every year in Hobart for two weeks face to face, it's going to be entirely online this year. So obviously, our sorry for the ping pings, it's not going to be that. And if I turn the, the sound off, then uh, you don't hear me. So I'm sorry for the disturbance. But what I'm saying is that the world is going into that direction, even long conference. Um, conferences are being held remotely. So obviously students will be prepared for that. And I think it also shows our adaptability. Um, I think we're pretty, a pretty switched on cohort and I could feel that when we transitioned fully online. As, as a part of your team uh, last semester, I thought the entire team did very well to adapt yes. uh, to the new learning and teaching uh, yep. platform. So well done to everyone at RMIT yes. Union. And, and to the students as well. Well done to yes, them that's too. That's correct. That's correct. Um, so in regards to the requirements, we said that you either need a bachelor of some sort, an undergraduate um, or, or, or a higher education degree of some sort, or five years of um, interpreting or translating experience to apply for the course. Is that right? That's correct. So you need an undergraduate um, a university degree or five years or, or more of professional experience. So even if you don't have academic qualifications, if you've been working in the industry for uh, a considerable amount of time, you can also apply for it. Uh, you will sit an aptitude test where we test the language skills of each candidate if you don't have any prior qualifications. And then upon the assessment, we decide if that person gets admitted to the program. Um, and let's say if someone was volunteering or as a part of their, uh, their current job, they're a bilingual and they were doing uh, a lot of translations and interpreting inherent to their current position, would that be seen as experience as well? So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a certified interpreter or a translator. No, that's correct. And we've had uh, quite a few applications of those people who've been working with uh, migrant settlement services, and they've been doing lots of translating and interpreting informally. We've got people who've been working for companies as um, bilingual administrative officers, and those people also would be eligible because the, the um, experience has to be related to the basic yes. language industry, or you have to demonstrate that you've been using both languages um, continually over a period of five years, but it doesn't need to be necessarily uh, in translating and inter as a certified translator or interpreter. I think, I think that's an important point to make out there. So if you were working as a bilingual worker uh, somewhere or you yes. have been volunteering um, at a not-for-profit, for example, translating, interpreting, offering services there, you would still be potentially eligible uh, to yes. apply for this position. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, very good. Uh, I have been with Dr. Erica Gonzalez Garcia today, uh, the program manager of the Master in Translating and Interpreting at RMIT University. And we specifically spoke about uh, the importance of formal training for TNI practitioners. And we spoke about the graduate certificate in translating and interpreting program that was just opened this semester. Um, heavy government subsidy on that uh, after about uh, uh, probably paying 95% of the entire course fee. Uh, potentially students would be paying $1,250 um, for this graduate certificate in translating and interpreting. And this will get you eligible to sit the NATI certified provisional interpreter test and the certified translator test. Um, and uh, 
hopefully uh, we're able to reach uh, some potential students. Um, sorry, when is the actual deadline that they can apply, actually? Actually, they yeah. can apply till basically the course starts 20th of July, which is, um, that means that probably they'll start a couple of weeks later because at the time, you know, it takes a bit of time to process it, to administer the, the test. But obviously, if someone is interested in doing it, I would say apply as soon as possible, but applications are open. Away. 20 July. And right. one thing I would like to say, Fatih, it's like in other professions, you know, they have, they after work on Friday, they go and get together or they go and have a coffee break together with other colleagues. Our profession is very isolating mm. to some extent, especially translators who are on their own at home or interpreters. I remember when I was a community interpreter, you go and see suddenly the Arabic interpreter or the Chinese interpreter, you wave at each other might have the chance to have a brief chat, but we work on our own. It so is a lonely me, profession, isn't it? <laughs> it is a lonely profession. So to me, it's um, being in, a, in an academic program or being part of a professional association allows you to connect with the profession, allows you to connect with your colleagues and learn. To me as a teacher, because I'm obviously uh, teaching mature students, um, who practice a lot more than I do, because obviously they are the ones out there interpreting in courts, in hospitals every day. I might teach the theoretical aspects, but I do learn from them a lot. So it's a symbiotic relationship. It's an exchange. And that's why it's so interesting in programs like ours at RMIT, but also at other Australian institutions, because we've got mature students. It builds a really nice community. Um, we've built up nice, strong professional relationships with prior students. To me, they are my colleagues, they are my peers, and you are united in some sort of environment that gives us a platform. That's, that's for definitely true. As, as a former student, I also have friends who were students with me, now colleagues, and we are still in touch with each other, yes. and, and we actually work with each other yes. as well. Um, yes. So I definitely understand where you're coming from. It kind of gets that loneliness out of... Yes. Uh, the profession and makes you feel you're part of a community, a broader community. That's that's correct. And that's really important, as I said, for a, a profession like ours. So I would say keep up, upwards and onwards. Um, and as I say, like in any other aspect of life, this is a profession we need to keep upskilling, learning every day to be able to provide the best possible service to our communities, sometimes in the most vulnerable situations in their lives. And, and I have to say that we play a pivotal role in a multicultural society like the Australian one. So um, it's a profession that I absolutely love. And I hope that those who attend my cl classes or those of my colleagues feel that because we are a bunch of very committed uh, teachers and academics and like myself in other, as I said, Australian institutions because we work closely together. But uh, I would say that take these opportunities when governments, uh, organizations engage to provide you with opportunities to improve and make the best of yourselves, grab those opportunities and, and definitely make the most of it. Thank you very much. And I guess we'd also like to thank uh, the government for providing the scholarship as well. Is that the state government or the federal government? Yes, this, this, one? One is the, this one is the federal government. Federal the, government. One, um, the scholarships for the TAPE sector are from the local Victorian government, local, I would say, state uh, Victorian government, and the tertiary education ones uh, in the university stream are funded by the federal government. Well, I guess uh, thank you to both uh, at state level and at the federal level to the governments um, uh, for providing these scholarships, which we said are pivotal and very important in our industry. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Erica Gonzalez Garcia of RMIT University. Um, and I thank you so much for being my first ever guest on our Conversations podcast. And hopefully I'll see you again uh, throughout the year, maybe wearing different hats, because I know you have a lot of them. Uh, yes, yes, it, it, it does get a bit uh, confusing sometimes, uh, but that's the other thing I would like to say, get involved, but get involved in your professional association, get involved with the union, get involved uh, with your employers. Um, this profession is as good as we make it as well. So obviously that's one of the things that I've noticed that many people, we like to complain a lot as well, but I'm one of those who thinks that if you're not happy about something, do something about it. 
And that's why I'm wearing different hats because in some areas I saw that, you know, there was lots to do and I thought, okay, maybe I can offer a little bit. So uh, yes, get involved with your colleagues, with the profession. And um, as I said, it will be a great avenue to connect. And it obviously takes lots of time, but it's also very gratifying. Indeed. Well, and also thank you to all our listeners and viewers. This was our first ever Conversations podcast. Um, hopefully I'll have many more guests over the next uh, few weeks. We aim to have a weekly podcast and um, get some guests in from all around the industry, including practitioners as well, um, because I'm sure they'll have a big input in what's going on and what needs to be going on as well. Um, so I have been Fatih Krakis. Um, from All Graduates Conversations podcast with Dr. Erika Gonzalez Garcia of RMIT University. And we hope to see you in the next episode. Thank you so much again. Dr. Thank you Erica. so much. All Graduates Conversations podcast.